What are the underlying social conditions faced by Jewish Ethiopians in Israel? Well, before you start to understand the discrimination that the Ethiopian community in Israel goes through, you have to understand that Israel is not comparable to the United States in the sense that Israel is not a democracy the way that Western democracies are democracies. Israel is an ethnocracy. And what that means is, is that Israel is a Jewish state uh, defining itself as a state for the Jewish people, uh, not just in Israel, also Jewish people all around the world. Uh, and it has elements of democratic rule for that Jewish population. But the Jewish people in Israel make up only two-thirds of the population. So a quarter of the citizens of Israel are not Jewish. Uh, and so they fall into uh, second-class and third-class citizen kind of um, standards. Now, the Ethiopians are Jewish, but they are black. And before this uh, struggle really rose up to the, uh, to the fore in recent weeks, we've seen another African population in Israel that has been challenging this ethnocratic uh, regime in Israel. And that population, of course, are the African refugees, mostly from Sudan and Eritrea, who are not Jewish. So basically what we're seeing here is that because Israel defines itself as a Jewish state, it has a different kind of category uh, of rights uh, and citizenship levels, depending uh, on how uh, the, you define yourself and how the state defines you in relation to that ethnicity. So if you are Jewish from, the, from Europe, uh, you are mo most likely in the highest position of power. You, will have the, uh, you have a naturalized citizenship and you have the highest access to power in Israeli society. The next levels uh, are uh, Jews that come from the Arab world and North Africa, uh, then Jews that came from Russia and the former Soviet Union in the 90s, and the bottom of the Jewish hierarchy in Israel are the Ethiopian Jews. After that, of course, you have the Palestinian citizens of Israel, the African refugees in Israel, which are most likely going to be deported very soon uh, en masse, and then after them, the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who are not citizens of any state and are therefore don't have... Uh, um, many rights. Leo, yeah, hold on one second. Let's talk about some specifics, though, uh, policies um, that that we want to kind of focus this on the African refugee policy, uh, population, for example. Just to speak to what the Israeli state has instituted um, in terms of housing and jobs, that and how does that affect the African refugee population? Well, you can't understand that without understanding ethnocracy. So what I'm trying to get at is there are two African populations in Israel that are black. There's the African refugees who are not Jewish and the African refugees who are Jewish. Both of them sort of fall in the cracks of the Israeli ethnocratic regime. The worst, of course, are the African refugees who are not Jewish. They don't have any rights, they don't have any status in Israel, and are basically living at the whim of whoever is the Minister of Interior and can be deported en masse to third countries at any moment. The Ethiopian citizens of Israel should have been, uh, or should at least, according to the uh, ideology of the ethnocratic regime of Israel, have the same rights as any other Jewish citizens, which, of course, in the ethnocratic hierarchy are the highest group. But because they are black, what you're seeing in practice is a lot of discrimination. And it goes back all the way from to the 1980s when they first came to Israel. Basically, the Ethiopian Jews uh, lived in Ethiopia, the region of uh, Ethiopia, for centuries. And finally, in the 80s, as a result of turmoil uh, in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Eritrea, started moving in the direction of Israel and finally were brought to Israel. Now, their uh, immigration to Israel was very different than the immigration of most uh, white uh, or Arab Jews because, first of all, they were kept in internment camps where they were uh, treated for many diseases. Their very Jewishness was questioned. Uh, they were forced to undergo mass circumcision. The men had to go through circumcision um, because the, the, the chief rabbinate of Israel did not believe that, in fact, they were Jewish. Um, and finally, the women, uh, in uh, some recent uh, investigations it was revealed, were subjected to uh, levels of criminal forced sterilization already in internment camps uh, in Africa and in Israel. And so we're talking about a population who, while are Jewish and should, according to the Zionist ideology, be welcome in Israel as Jewish citizens, had to undergo 
humiliating and incredibly racist uh, borderline criminal policies uh, where their Jewishness was questioned and their women were sterilized uh, in camps where uh, Jewish immigration agents were basically trying to tell them where you come from, you have too many babies and you have to change your entire family planning if you want to come to Israel so there aren't too many black babies. Of course, the same kind of policy does not apply to religious Jewish people who are white, who have between seven and 12 children per family. So that's, uh, the discrimination goes back to the very beginning of their immigration to Israel. Then, of course, the question of where this population was settled has everything to do with why they are today one of the most impoverished, isolated, and marginalized communities in Israel. Basically, Israeli power uh, and economy rests between two centers, a few neighborhood in, neighborhoods in Jerusalem and a few neighborhoods in Tel Aviv. And if you don't live within that center of power, your access to basically um, a middle class or upper middle class livelihood are very limited. Uh, and of course, the, the most impoverished populations, the Jews that came from the Arab world, North Africa, and these Ethiopian Jews have been settled traditionally in the periphery, in the far north or the far south, in basically ghettos. These are some of the most impoverished communities in Israel with some of the least investments by the governments uh, the, uh, of all of the municipalities in Israel, except for, of course, the Palestinian municipalities. So first of all, you see a uh, very minimal investment in them, the least investment of any Jewish community in Israel. You're seeing that, in fact, they end up in the most uh, frontier units in the army. Uh, the Ethiopians end up often in the Magav, which is the border pro uh, police units in the army. So they are taking on the brunt of the violence that is perpetrated by the Israeli army, not somewhere in a comfortable office where with a joystick you kill Palestinians with a drone. They are on the front line. They are the ones who are uh, basically perpetrating the Israeli uh, regime's policies against the Palestinians. And when they come home, they, they basically find themselves the most impoverished, neglected community in Israel. At the same time, there's a lot of racism in Israel um, based on the fact that they are black. They're often confused for African refugees. They're often arbitrarily uh, arrested. The police, which has a very racist uh, practice towards the African refugees, treats the Ethiopians often as uh, African refugees, bringing to the fore a lot of this racism. Now, the reason that these protests are happening now and not, let's say, two years ago is because uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 14, 15 months, we've seen um, the, the, is, the Israeli government's attack on the African refugees, which brought to the surface a lot of these complaints about racism in Israel and a lot of the complaints about the way that African people are treated in Israel. Um, now, after the government finished, basically, its attack on the African refugees, the uh, Ethiopians saw that uh, the same racism which is perpetrated against the refugees is perpetrated against them. They are often treated as African refugees. They have the same, they feel that they have the same uh, policies and practices practiced against them. We're seeing constant attacks. We're seeing constant violence by the police. We're seeing the police constantly question people on the street, treating them like criminals, questioning their uh, identity, questioning their uh, visas, asking them to prove that they're Jewish, all kinds of harassment. And uh, these protests particularly ha uh, come at the heels of that movement of the African refugees and against the African refugees by the government. So basically, the, the protest that happened last weekend uh, was, was very radical in a way, because the protesters, until now, the Ethiopian community has uh, refrained from protesting in what uh, in, in the kind of protest that we see in Baltimore and other places mm -hmm. in Israel. Uh, their, their protests have been very pacifist, very peaceful. For the first time in their history, they go out in a radical protest and they block the main highway in Tel Aviv, in the economic center of Israel. And what you see in that protest is that many of them are holding their hands like this. Now, this is a, a, an echo of a symbol that came out in the African refugee protest. In the African refugee protest, this symbolized uh, arbitrary imprisonment mm. because, of course, the Israeli policies meant that uh, African refugees are imprisoned indefinitely in the large camp in the middle of the desert uh, until they agree to self-deport to, uh, to African countries such as Uganda and Rwanda. And you saw everywhere in the country the symbol of the two hands with the word freedom underneath. The fact that the Ethiopian Jewish 
uh, protesters are emulating this symbol uh, shows that they are connecting their struggle to the struggle of the African refugees, which I have to say is a very brave position because the African refugees in Israel are one of those uh, issues where everyone sort of agrees on this atrocious thing. Everybody agrees that the African refugees are refugees and they probably suffered horrible things in Africa, but they agree that there's no place for them in Israel and they should by and large be deported. There's very few Israelis that, are, that believe that the African refugees should receive asylum in Israel and stay. Most Israelis, and this is why this was such a successful political attack uh, by the uh, uh, all levels of the Israeli government, from the prime minister and down to the offices of the Ministry of Interior, is that most of the Israelis agreed to deport the African refugees. And the fact that the, the Ethiopian Jews are making this link with the most marginalized and weakest community in Israel is a very brave thing. And I think that the reason they're doing it is to say that racism is racism, and whether it's Jewish or not. Unfortunately, though, they are also wrapping their message in a lot of Israeli nationalist symbols. So while they're crossing their arms and yelling freedom, they're also wrapping themselves in Israeli flags and appealing to the Israeli public in a way that, uh, uh, that really uh, kind of pulls on the Zionist and nationalist extremes. So they're singing the anthem. They're constantly talking about how they serve the country in the military, and they're not against what the country is doing. They just want to be treated as equal Jewish citizens. So in a way, they are both making links that are very radical and very promising and very interesting in terms of the anti-racist struggle in Israel. But on the other hand, they're doing it by appealing to Zionist values so as to not to alienate themselves from the Israeli mainstream. Now, the response to their protest, and this is, I, I think, perhaps is the most telling and what we should be watching for in the coming protests, is that the state responded with violence, mass violence, in the heart of Tel Aviv, in Rabin Square, a place where you've seen hundreds of demonstrations on every issue in the world, from, uh, you know, uh, health care um, subsidies to the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict to housing. Every protest that happens in Tel Aviv happens in this square. And this uh, is the first protest in years that the Israeli police open, uh, 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 basically attack with massive, um, both uh, policemen on horses and tear gas. We've seen a lot of violence from the police. Uh, we've seen a lot of attacks, the kinds that most uh, protests, which are, of course, uh, white protests or protests by what white Israelis never see. Mm. And so the exceptionalization of this kind of protest is going to be very polarizing in the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli media and in Israeli conversation. And this is what we should be uh, watching for, because if the government continues to respond with this kind of violence, they're looking at alienating a large chunk of the Israeli uh, population and basically uh, creating a, a, a crack in the, the, the Zionist mythology of the Jewish unity in Israel. Leah, very fascinating commentary. Thank you so much for being with us.